So, yes, I think there'll be, we're bound to hear in the days which come about some hedge fund somewhere, which has uh, suffered a big loss. And then the question will be, is that an important hedge fund and who are they exposed to in terms of banks? Are the banks they're exposed to excessively exposed to the hedge fund? We'll wait and see what comes. But I would say the situation is fragile at the moment. Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023, Maneco 64, home of alternative economics and contrarian views. So I've got Clive Thompson back today to speak about 1987 and what happened then uh, to the stock market, to interest rates, and what's happening today as well to Credit Suisse and how things could evolve. There's a note saying, uh, or a Bible uh, verse, Ecclesiastes 1, 9, that goes like this. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. So, uh, Clive, welcome to the channel again. How are you? Uh, good morning, Mary. It's been quite a tumultuous week in the financial markets. Yes, yeah, especially since we spoke last. Uh, I think it was Sunday uh, not this past Sunday, but the Sunday before, we were uh, talking about SVB, and then everything kicked off in Europe with Credit Suisse as well. And uh, so if you want to um, talk a little bit about Credit Suisse and what, what, you were, what you're seeing, how it could impact these uh, 81, 81 bonds, and also UBS, are, are, are they now in trouble? So uh, if, if we step back to last week, we had a series of statements from Credit Suisse and from the Swiss regulator, that's FINMA and the Swiss National Bank, saying everything is perfectly in order. Credit Suisse is a wonderful bank and there should be no problem at all. Um, a few months ago, uh, we had the Saudis put in a lot of extra money. Um, and uh, if we go back perhaps uh, to last year where the Saudis put in the money, that seemed like a very good moment for people to buy Credit Suisse shares because with the extra money it it kind of sounded like the bank would be saved. Uh, as we now know, that was not the case. Um, anyway, we've got to Friday uh, afternoon. The share price was crashing. And come Sunday afternoon, a, a deal was struck with UBS. Initially, they said it was going to be sold for $1 billion, then $2 billion, then $3 billion, then three and a quarter billion. So UBS is buying the shares of Credit Suisse for three and a quarter billion dollars. Uh, which seems to me to be quite a bargain. Um, they're paying about 70, 80 cents per share, um, which uh, compared with the book value of about 10 francs per share is, is perhaps a bit of a coup for UBS. Um, and coming with it is a lot of support from the Swiss National Bank. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the write-off of a bunch of Credit Suisse bonds um, and there's a lot, a lot of noise being made by, about this by the hedge funds which own these bonds. They're, they're known as additional tier one bonds. And uh, last, uh, when we had our meeting uh, on, about two weeks ago, I showed you a photograph of one of them where the price had dropped down to 40%, showing that investors didn't have a lot of confidence in these bonds. Um, and just to fulfill the picture, they're trading at about 1% now. Um, yeah. and the, the frustration... Uh, that some investors are suffering is they thought that bonds ranked ahead of equity. And that's definitely true in a liquidation. But these are, these type of bonds, they're known as uh, nicknamed COCOs, which stands for contingent convertible, but the correct name is additional tier one capital. And they come with risk warnings written all over them. Uh, the risk warnings are so much so that retail investors cannot buy them full stop. And sophisticated investors, those are investors who have a certain number of millions in the bank, may buy them. But even then, they won't be allowed to buy them. I mean, I'm talking about Swiss rules until they've already signed some statements. It's a, 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 that's a document which is a contingent convertible uh, or AT1 document, which basically spells out in words of one syllable how risky these bonds are and that you're likely to lose all your money. Uh, but nevertheless, wealthy investors did want to buy them because they had a much higher interest rate than ordinary bonds. And we must remember we we're coming from a, a, an era of almost zero interest rates and negative rates in Switzerland. Uh, so when you could buy a bond which seemed to have a positive carry, 
even though it seemed risky, you took a v- many people took the view banks won't go bust. I'll take that extra interest, and if it goes bust, probably the government will bail it out because it's uh, uh, important to the system. Uh, so I'll be okay, and uh, the people who lose their money will be the shareholders. But when you burrow down and look at the prospectus of these bonds, it actually spells it out in words of one syllable that you might lose your money. And I, I just I, I've got here copy of page one of one of the credits was contingent convertible bonds. And I'll just read a few, a line or two from it. Uh, Clive, it can said, I uh, remind the viewers who haven't heard you before how you know that and all these things? Well, because Clive used to manage wealthy people's money at a private bank in Switzerland. He's retired now. So he's been used to, for decades, looking into these things. And that's why he found this. Yeah, so my career was 47 years in private banking, wealth management for wealthy individuals, the sort of individuals who might want to buy these sort of bonds. Um, It's not the advice I'd give anyone to buy them, but people are quite uh, anxious to uh, own high yield instruments. And these were one of those things which are out there. But anyway, when I read uh, a few lines of this uh, prospectus, it says, if a write down event occurs... In such circumstances, interest on the notes shall cease to accrue. The full principal amount of each note will automatically and permanently be written down to zero. Holders will lose their entire investment in the notes and all the rights of any holder for payment of any accrued or unpaid interest or any other amounts under or in respect of the notes shall become null and void. So basically they're saying if a write-down event occurs, you get nothing. And then I turn to about the 100th page, which is Schedule 7, which describes the word, what is a write-down? And there's two types of write-down. One is a contingency event, which talks about uh, uh, um, the uh, common equity tier one ratio compared with uh, other assets. And the other one is called a validity event. And I'll just read the validity event again, a a line or two from it. Uh, Sorry, not validity, a viability event. So this is an event which will cause the notes to be worthless. A viability event is because customary measures to improve Credit Suisse's capital adequacy are, at the time, inadequate or unfeasible, or an essential requirement to prevent Credit Suisse Group from becoming insolvent, bankrupt, or unable to pay a material part of its debts, or Credit Suisse Group has received an irrevocable commitment of extraordinary support from the public sector beyond customary transactions in the ordinary course of business that will have the effect of improving Credit Suisse Group's capital adequacy, and without which... In the determination of the regulator, Credit Suisse would have become insolvent, bankrupt, or unable to pay a material part of its debts. So there you have it in black and white. Uh, This type of bond uh, can go to zero, even if the equity still has a value. Uh, So in an insolvency, equity is the last to be paid. But in an event such as what they call a write-down event, the Equity holders might survive, but the bondholders, those who hold these contingent convertible bonds, can and will lose all of their money, which is what has actually happened. Um, Needless to say, there's a lot of people complaining about this, saying it's unfair that the equity holders should get something and they should be treated more favorably. And I'm sure the Saudis are going to make a lot of noise about this too. Yeah, they and uh, like uh, sorry, Clive. It looks pretty clear, uh, black and white to me. And uh, if the buyers of these bonds had read the prospectus, they 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 probably they shouldn't be surprised. Uh, and I I read that there's a 250 billion market of these, and you said that hedge funds are the biggest owners of these, and, and hedge funds are highly funded by the big too big to fail through their prime brokerage. So if you could touch upon that, and I'm sorry I interrupted you there about the Saudis. Um, yeah, so uh, I'll come back to that on the hedge funds in a second, but I think there's a very uh, it looks black and white. They've got no case to answer uh, when they sue. But I think they probably will sue. And it's not just the Saudis who sue. I think hedge funds will sue as well. And the grounds they're going to have to sue 
uh, will be a statement by the Swiss National Bank uh, last Wednesday, a week ago, on the 13th, which says, and I read it to I read a line to you from it, Credit Suisse meets the capital and liquidity requirements posed on systematically important banks. If necessary, the SNB will provide Credit Suisse with liquidity. And then it goes on. FINMA confirms that Credit Suisse meets the higher capital and liquidity requirements applicable to systematically important banks. In addition, the SNB will provide liquidity to the globally active bank if necessary. Uh, so four days after saying everything is perfect, they say it's not perfect. And that will, I think, lead to some court cases. And uh, whilst I don't think those who go to court would win a case, uh, they might reasonably hope to have a negotiated settlement and get something which is more than nothing. Yeah, it seems to me that uh, FINMA and the Swiss National Bank weren't being too economic. Uh, they're being economical with the truth there. there uh, there's a saying by uh, Jean-Claude Juncker that says when things get really bad, <laughs> you know, you, we lie. Uh, so <laughs> maybe, or maybe things change very, they can change very quickly in four days, as we saw with SVB. So uh, it, what about like uh, the other uh, AT, uh, tier one, AT1 bonds that are out there? Are there prospectus for other banks very similar to Credit Suisse uh, perspective? Um, they are similar, but quite often there's a difference. Uh, the peculiarity about Credit Suisse, and I think the same one about uh, for UBS, is that there is a clause which allows the bonds to be written down to zero. In many cases, and this is why you have to read the prospectus, that clause allows for the conversion of the bonds into shares of the bank at a particular ratio. Uh, but that still means you lose almost all of your money because the time when this clause will be triggered is the time when the bank is in trouble and the shares, therefore, will be worth close to zero. So it, it, in principle, it's the same thing. If a bank gets into trouble and you hold these bonds, whether you're converted to shares or whether you lose your money, you're going to lose most of it, if not all, in such an event. So there's the warning. And we come back to all these hedge funds who bought these bonds. Why they bought the bonds? Because hedge funds seek to make an excess return. Uh, so by buying bonds yielding, uh, if we if we look at uh, normally they were yielding, even in the really best of times, 6 to 8%. And now we're probably oh, well over 10% on, on the average. Uh, I don't have the figure in my head, but I did uh, briefly before I went on the show look at a fund, I won't name it, which is only investing in uh, tier um, additional capital, tier one bonds or cocos, as it's known. That fund was trading last year at 108, it's now trading at 68. So it's 40% down from where it was last year. Uh, and that kind of indicates where people see the risk. And of course, the, the biggest part of that fall occurred in the last couple of days. So people are selling uh, their cocos. And of course, these types of funds which own the cocos have no choice but to sell them into the market as well, because people are redeeming their fund units. So the 6 uh, or 8% in normal times, was that when rates were at zero or even negative? Yes. Yeah. I, mean, it was, I can't remember the exact rate, but I would say it was many, many percent above normal and you know, fair compensation, compensation for the risk you were taking. Uh, but people who did this were only high net worth individuals or corporations or hedge funds who were seeking that extra yield. Uh, of course, there were pension funds doing it as well because they were struggling to pay the pensions at zero percent interest. Uh, so these bonds are widely held by sophisticated and knowledgeable investors. Strictly speaking, there shouldn't be any retail investors holding them. Well, it, it seems to me like uh, very clear when, when rates are at zero, when you're getting five or six. Uh, I mean, that seems very risky to me. And I'm surprised that uh, pension funds uh, would get involved. And uh, I don't have any like uh, sympathy for the the people who lost all their their money with the Credit Suisse one, uh, because I, it would have uh, even if I had billions and I've seen I would see that I'd say well there's something wrong here maybe put a little bit but not that uh, not so much to hurt me, but uh, so do you think this could be a potential 
like black swan that could trigger an event at the hedge funds and then we know that a lot of these hedge funds uh they're just like old traders from banks who can't do what they do at uh at the banks they go and open a hedge fund and they're still funded by their old uh, uh old employers so i, I could see uh, uh, an event w what's your thinking uh, well, when I was working, I was often asked by my clients what I thought of hedge funds, uh, otherwise known as alternative investments. And my answer is, I don't think anything at all. Um, I've got no opinion, no positive, no negative opinion. I, I just, they're not my cup of tea. Uh, but it, it's fair to say uh, that uh, hedge funds have to try and either produce an extra, excess return for their clients or a reduced volatility to justify their existence. And in return for that, they take very heavy fees. Um, typically, a hedge fund has got higher fees than a normal fund. And on top of that, it's got uh, a fee on what they call excess returns above a certain watermark. So if they earn more than 5% or 10% or whatever the figure is, they'll probably take 20% of the excess. So it, 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 that's great if they can produce these excess returns. And if we go back to the 1990s and early 2000s, that was indeed the case. Um, hedge funds could literally go out there, take extreme risks, and there were plenty of them around which were producing outstanding returns compared with the stock markets. Uh, seemed like a great idea, but then long-term capital management went bust in about 1999, and all kinds of regulations came in affecting hedge funds, and not least of which they were all forced to employ risk managers. And the risk managers said to them, listen, you've got to stop insider trading. You've got to stop uh, having too much leverage in one position. So they started to become a lot more diversified, and the returns um, over the years as they brought in more and more risk controls have diminished. Um, but it doesn't mean to say there aren't hedge funds which will be excessively exposed to cocos. There will be. Whenever something goes wrong, whether it's interest rates rising a lot or some commodity price changing like nickel going to the moon as it did uh, last year or uh, cocos going to zero uh, or going down a lot as just has just happened, there will be somebody at the wrong end. There always is when there's a big price change in something. So, yes, I think there'll be – we're bound to hear the, in the days which come about some hedge fund somewhere which is – uh, suffered a big loss. And then the question will be, is that an important hedge fund and who are they exposed to in terms of banks? Are the banks they're exposed to excessively exposed to the hedge fund? Yes. And it looks like uh, even the US government now has come out and, and said that they want to uh, insure all deposits, and uh, which seems crazy. It, it just makes me believe that things are not as good as they look underneath the surface. But uh, maybe we could switch to the uh, 1987 uh, event that you uh, you've kept a lot of uh, newspapers from from that period, which is interesting. And we can compare what happened then and what's happening now. Uh, today we had the uh, UK. Uh, well, they call it inflation data. I call it price data. The government here is expecting uh, the CPI to have by the end of the year. Well, they're not doing a very good job of it uh, because it was expected to drop to 9.9%, came out at 104 And even the RPI, which was used prior to the late 90s and is a better reflection of rising prices for the average household, that came out at 134 And our base rate is still 4%. Bank of England meets tomorrow. Uh, I think that it's gonna be difficult for them not to do anything. And uh, I see that you've got some comparisons of uh, uh, inflation and interest rates back then. So <laughs> I leave it to you now, uh, Clive. So so one of the things I, I, I did was collect uh, some of the papers in around the time of the 1987 stock market crash. Uh, it was it became known as Black Monday, uh, which was the, the the worst crash in all of history. I'll just show you a few headlines here. Um, in terms of points and in terms of percentage, uh, these are French newspapers. Uh, this one says "tornado on the ball on the stock exchange," and here's the Herald Tribune. It yeah. says uh, New York stocks take the biggest drop. So uh, that was back then. And, and just to show you, here's a, a collection of some of the newspapers I've got from the era, both before, during, and after the crash of 1987. Now, everybody knows about the 1929 crash, but that was actually nothing on the day compared with Black Monday in 
1987. So we're just going to look at a few slides here. Um, as you can see on this slide, the in 1929, the Dow Jones dropped by 30 points, and in 1987, it dropped by 500 points. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can see the loss in percentage was 22% in 87, which was double the 1929 crash. So it was a very big crash. That is the biggest crash ever. Mm -hmm. um, however, where it differs somewhat is if the 1929 crash was the forerunner to a, the Great Depression, and the market carried on going downwards for several years, um, whereas the 1987 crash marked the bottom of, it marked the best time to buy. Um, and I'm just showing you here the, the uh, figures from 1929. You can see Black Tuesday marked, uh, which came after Black Monday in a, in a certain sense, uh, though they didn't really refer to that one. But the, the big day that everyone refers to was down 11% Black Tuesday, Next day, we had a 12% rise in 1921. And then after that, the stock market continued downwards for many years, as you can see on that little chart there. And now we move to 1987. And the crash here on the logarithmic scale of 1987, it's almost invisible, even though it was bigger than the single day in 1929. Uh, but of course, because this is a long term chart in 1929, the market carried on downwards, whereas in 1987, it turned around fairly quickly. Yeah, it's amazing. That. It, it looks just like a blip, the 87 crash. Uh, and um, I, I, if you go back a little bit, there's another. Is that the uh, there's a the 2008 crash looks uh, maybe a third of the uh, 29. That's right. Yes, you can see in the in the uh, right up here, uh, you can see my mouse, I think. Yeah, that, that, that's the recession of 2008. Yeah. Uh, oh, no, that's not too, is that, yeah, yeah, that's 2008, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then we have 2020 there as well, looking like a blip. Which was, which, was which was just there where my mouse is. That's 2020, which was the COVID collapse. So do you think we're going to have something like 29 soon? That wouldn't be very, that would be massive uh, in no, uh, notion, nominal terms. Uh, well, I think what I've just demonstrated by showing the comparison between 1929 and between 1987 and some of the subsequent crashes is that history sometimes repeats itself and sometimes doesn't. Uh, you can't actually tell uh, which way the cookie's going to crumble, but there are some differences and some similarities. So we'll, we'll have a look at those and see uh, which conclusion we might reach as I go through it here. Um, just to uh, show after what happened in 1929, you can see on the right-hand side, top line, that after 1929, uh, five years later, people had lost another 59%, and 10 years later, they'd lost 33% since the crash. Whereas at 1987, five years later, they'd actually gained 83% and 10 years later they gained 351%. Uh, now we'll look at a few of the headlines that I saw in 1987. Uh, this is from one of my newspapers. You can see the headline, Record Falls on Wall Street Trigger Worldwide Slide. Heavy selling hits bosses all over Europe. Bankers try to restore confidence in the dollar accord. Hmm. Tornado on the stock exchange. This is a picture. I think it might be of the Geneva exchange. And here one. Here's another one. Uh, the Dow Jones plum plummets in a wave of frenzied selling. Selling. A picture of a dealer at his desk. Yeah. Um, now, just the backdrop to this. If we go a little bit before what happened and why the stock exchange might have happened, we had some nervousness earlier in the year over the Texaco bankruptcy, which was the biggest in all of history. Now, some people who know what subsequently happened, Texaco eventually came out of bankruptcy and became a large company before it was taken over by Chevron. But at the time, uh, they had been sued by uh, I don't remember, Pennzoil or somebody and had lost, had an 11 billion court judgment against them. And they were going to go bankrupt, or at least they filed for bankruptcy at the time. And that was creating some nervousness for investors. Let's look at where we stood in 1987 on interest rates and inflation. Now, this is very interesting. Back in 1987, at the lower part of the chart, you can see that the inflation rate was quite low. 
at least compared with today. Uh, you just gave a very high number for the UK inflation. Um, back then, we we're at, let's call it 4%, and the USA was at 3.5%, something like that. So modest inflation compared with today. But if you now look at the top of the chart where it says interest rates, you can see that the interest rates in the United States and the UK were much higher than the inflation rate. Put that into perspective, you could put your money in the bank and make a real return even after paying your taxes. In other words, your money was your money in the bank was savings, and you were saving because you were accumulating wealth even after paying your tax because the interest rate was higher than the inflation rate. Compare that with today, and that's uh, the next slide looks the same as this one, but it's actually different numbers, so I'll just move forward there. Here's 2022-23. Right now, um, I, I know the figure I, I'm showing is 8.8. .8. That's uh, from uh, the start of the year. So in the UK, inflation was 8%. It's now 10%. USA, 6%. Uh, last year, it was 25 and 4% inflation. But the interest rates last year and this year were way below and still are the rate of inflation. So right now, those who put their money in their bank have a negative real return, and they have to pay tax on that negative return as well. So they're basically going to go backwards if you put your money in the bank. At these interest rates, it is not a good deal to put your money in the bank from a savings perspective. Banks are not a good place for saving, nor money market funds or, or cash or any other type of financial instrument, including bonds. They're not good instruments for saving at these rates of instrument, uh, interest because you're going forwards slower than the rate of inflation. Yeah, and so uh, that's just... The Today, the uh, UK CPI came out at 10.4, but there's the other one, like I, I said, uh, RPI, which is a much better reflection of the average household. That's 13.4. Uh, so uh, it, it's a huge uh, tax uh, on savers and also on people earning in that currency, I would say. Um, I personally think you should keep some money in the bank for your foreseen needs. And that depends whether you have a job, depends whether you're retired, depends what your other resources are. Um, so each person might want to keep anything from one month to one year's uh, spending in the bank. But beyond that, it's it's no good putting money in the bank as saving for your retirement. And uh, Clive, uh, just uh, one thing I've uh, read uh, and uh, heard about the Great Depression. Yes, people lost a lot of money in the stock market but apparently more people people lost more money because the banks failed there are there are a lot of bank failures in the us in 1933 uh and uh <laughs> that's what gets me concerned nowadays because we're starting to see banks fail so could we be going into uh 1929 1933 style uh, move uh, especially with what you just said about it not being really uh, a good thing to keep uh, that much uh, money in the bank. Well, I think today risks are far more intertwined between the countries and between different banks, uh, whereas back then the banks were pretty much standalone situations. Um, so it, it's kind of normal back then to have expected lots of bankruptcies from the many thousands and thousands of banks across the United States, all with different names, um, uh, because some of them wouldn't have been very prudent in the, well, I say wouldn't have been prudent, perhaps they were, but th there was a great depression going on and people lost their jobs and couldn't pay their debts. Um, so it's not surprising there were a lot of bankruptcies back then. The system for banks and the rules rating banks are much, much tougher and tighter these days, and especially so after 2008, but it doesn't mean to say it can't happen. And as the events of the last few weeks have demonstrated, it does happen, it, uh, and it can happen again. Um, I'm an optimist. I'd like to think that if it starts to go heavily wrong, the governments will step in and save the banking system, um, and my deposits will be safe. This is what I hope, um, and I think the probability is that will happen. But you have to be prepared for everything. Never say never. And everybody should plan 
what are they going to do or think about what would they do if they wake up one morning and find their bank is closed and that they can't get the money out or do anything or use their credit card for a month? I uh, I was reading something uh, yesterday, I think it was in the FT, about this uh, possible guarantee of all deposits by the U.S. Treasury because they did use conditions. They said if a bank uh, proves to be systemically important, uh, we will step in. So it, it seems to me that it's not guaranteed for everyone. Uh, but despite that, I read a comment and someone said, this is going to make uh, the banks even more irresponsible because they're going to say, well, all the deposits are guaranteed. And the uh, so wanted to know what, uh, what you think about that. And the other point I'd like to ask you, yes, it might be uh, comforting to know that the government will step in and guarantee all deposits. But what's the consequence of that to the currency and to, to its purchasing power? Um, first of all, um, the optimist in me says that the people who are working for these large banks would like to keep their jobs. And if the bank fails, they're going to get fired. So the uh, dilemma they're facing is, do I maximize the profits by taking big risks and then maybe lose my job? Or do I behave prudently and I'll be one of the survivors 10 years from now when my other competitor banks have failed? Um, so there will be prudent banks and there'll be less prudent banks. Um, that's the first thing. And what was the second question you asked, Mario? Yeah, um, the consequence, because you said earlier a few minutes ago that uh, my your hope was that governments would step in to uh, make your deposits whole and uh, they wouldn't let the system implode. And my question is, what's the consequence, though? Uh, yes, your, your, your savings might be there in the bank, but will they buy anything? Uh, my question is, do you see uh, uh, the basement of the currency as a consequence of that? Um, I think the debasement of the currency is uh, going to happen, whether as a consequence of this or not. Um, we, At the moment, we're in a gradual debasement because the rate of money printing is um, it's increasing, and it has to increase because the government debt as a percentage of GDP is rising and will continue to rise. And we passed the point of no return where, due to higher interest rates, the government's cost of financing itself, i.e. paying the interest on its national debt, the new debt that it has to borrow, will be increasing. And that's not just the USA, it's everywhere in the world. Um, and so at any moment, uh, you could have uh, the equivalent of the little boy shouting out that the emperor has got no clothes, and the man in the street realizes and pulls his money from the banks and tries to spend it in the shops, and then the shop shelves are empty, and then you have rioting, and then you have to the government has to do something, in which case that is the moment uh, to herald in a new monetary system, probably gold backed, but it could be backed by something else. Um, and just just on that, Mario, I did a little calculation this morning to see how much the gold price would have to be if the UK was to back its currency by gold. Uh, it was a quick back of the envelope calculation, but I think it would need to be about $10,000 an ounce. Yeah, I'm not surprised by that uh, figure. And uh, just before we conclude, uh, what's your uh, view of what uh, the Fed's going to do today? Uh, Bank of England's meeting today um, with all the... Uh, mayhem that's happened in the last couple of weeks does it change anything do you think they're going to keep uh the fed's going to keep raising rates and being tough on inflation or even the bank of england i mean uh, andrew bailey said a few weeks ago that uh it doesn't look like we need to raise rates that much anymore and that he expected inflation to come down but it doesn't seem to be happening if they raise rates they'll be heavily criticized that that was the wrong decision if they lower rates, they'll be heavily criticized that that was the wrong decision. And if they stand still, they'll be heavily criticized for not taking any, any action. Um, but I'm afraid it's like the rabbit in the headlights. Uh, there is no way to turn. You, you, can't, you can't run left, you can't run right. And if you do nothing, you, all three ways you're dead. So really, it's a, it's a terrible situation. I wouldn't like to be in the shoes of any central bank governor now, because there is 
there's no right answer. Um, and I, you know, if I could, uh, if I could find a right answer, I'd tell them. But um, my my only proposal, uh, and this was some years ago, was to print the money and do what the Swiss do, make their money out of chocolate, and then at least we'd eat it. But uh, <laughs> that was a bit of a joke. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Uh, my feeling is that uh, central banking is going to come heavily into question with what's coming up, but uh, we'll see what uh, happens about that. Uh, Clive, uh, thank you again for coming on, and it's always great to speak with you. Uh, your historic uh, historical perspective is really interesting today. I think the viewers will enjoy that. Have a, have a good rest of the week. Thank you, Mario. Nice talking to you. Enjoy the week. Thank you.